Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out tonight to It's All Black Academic Live here at Box Park. My name is Jordan. I'll be hosting our debate for this evening. First of all, a big thank you to Box Park for having us here tonight. This is part of a uh, number of events and talks they'll be having this month during Black History Month to mark this fantastic month for, for our fantastic people. Um, and we'll be here again on the 15th doing another debate, uh, or same, same place in two weeks' time. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that show in just a couple of weeks time but thank you for coming out tonight um where it's all black academic and if you don't know who the hell we are and who that what, what we do um i will go into a bit of detail about that in just a moment but we've got together a little bit of a compilation of our previous series um to give you a little bit of a flavor of what we do and who we are <laughs> I am talking about a child, they haven't gone home. They haven't, they haven't, haven't gone home, home. They haven't and that is the home. point I'm making. If your child hasn't gone home from school at 9 o'clock and you don't seem bothered, something is wrong. Corey's situation broke me. It was episode 4, I was in absolute bits for many reasons. Um, one, he clearly had a learning difficulty. And it's so interesting when you see someone, or a black person, who seems to have a mental health issue or some kind of disability, their tr the treatment of them is so different. I wouldn't say that racism would have necessarily been the biggest thing. I see prejudice against ourselves within the NHS and in how we treat ourselves even. Most of our music is very sexual. Mm -hmm. So we, I've learned a lot of stuff from that. Like we like to gyrate, we mm -hmm. like to whine, we mm -hmm. like to do all these things. They're very sexual. So even not getting taught by our parents, listening to music and that is, is an influence as well. Mm -hmm. How we dance in the clubs and things like that. It's very sexual mm -hmm. being Caribbean. It seemed to us as fun, but to other people, it might seem like basically they're having sex on a dance yeah, floor. Yeah. From a medical point of view, I've seen students, I've seen doctors who will wash their hands when a black patient comes in, but then they won't wash their hands when other patients come oh, in. Wow. So you're thinking, okay, Unconsciously, you may have done that, but what what is your thought process behind that? When you go to places like Comic Con, it's rare that you won't find a black person in Comic Con. Like they're everywhere, but when you take that as a reflection of the no community, everyone assumes it's just white. Very good question. Because the first night I was watching, I was watching with a couple of white people, mm -hmm. and um, it's just like after dinner or so, we put it on. We just thought, let's see this. We've heard a lot about it, or so, and I thought, yep, this is good. I reached one point where about halfway through the first episode. Um, a friend of mine just got up and just said, I can't do it. I'm sorry, I can't do it. I can't, I, this is too much for me right now. And it was quite literally, she was already in tears. If you're not on the streets and like carrying a knife, then like you're doing good. Like, no, that's, yeah. that's standard. And if we were not here and we were in an African country or a Caribbean country or something, then that wouldn't be the standard. The idea that she would just be on road at whatever, that in my mind just, didn't work. So in their school uniform, because that's a critical point. <laughs> I kind of find that like when someone does talk about sex, like I'm someone who does openly talk about sex a lot of the time, uh, obviously that is also why it's my job, mm. but like um, I find that that either intimidate, intimidates people or like makes certain men think that that means I'm like easy yeah. or open and it's like actually I don't want to have sex with you, I just want to talk. When you see it in like South Park and stuff like that, like the portrayers, <laughs> is it? There's these gremlins, there's these gremlins. I'm just thinking, come on, I'm not, I'm not like that. I just yeah. said the, the image is different because I don't, of course, like, this is a game in top, this is a, it's an esports team. Okay. Esports is a whole different realm. We come from a history where our bodies, as well as being eroticized and fetishized, have been experimented on time and time again. I've had situations where you see um, a, a single mom and she tells you, oh, um, the dad of the child has XYZ children with XYZ number of women. And I'm, how did you not know that? How should she know yeah, that? Yeah, she, she doesn't no. always know that. You click, take some time for your mind and get off them head trips. Don't try to play me. See, my name's not Dick. The tribe is the crew that makes so that is that is us we have honest open and very progressive discussions around topics and issues that we feel uh, are important or relevant to the black community and this was born out of uh, just not seeing certain things discussed in the mainstream that we felt were very important to our community and our, and our culture and if they were they weren't being handled in the correct way with the relevant voices so we just thought Chuck, let's just set up our own show and have our own discussions in a safe space where we can talk about things 
where we won't be judged and we're coming from a place of being very informed rather than featuring on the things like Piers Morgan show and LBC where convos that uh, are about black people often get distorted and are often from a place of, of misinformed. So that's what we've been doing for about a year. We're on YouTube, so if you guys use YouTube or use the internet, which I'm sure you all do, we have a website, blackademic.com. Uh, that's blackademic spelled without a C. Check out some of our content from our three series and our podcast and all of our photos and a little bit more information about us. Um, I want to thank also my fantastic team here as well that helped me put together tonight and all of our shows. So what we're going to do tonight is have a discussion around something that I think is quite important. We're going to discuss tonight um, black British history. So often when you're at school or at college and you hear about black history, it's often through the perspective of American history. But we, I say we, I'm me for sure, and I know many people like me often don't know too much about um, our history in this country and our contributions and key figures and key dates in this country. So I've got three guests I'm gonna to call to the panel to have a discussion around black history, what we need to know, what we should know, and how we can go about knowing more about, like I say, our contributions and our, our input into this, into this country. So, can I call to the stage, please? Get my notes here. Um, I've got here Angelina Osborne, who is a historian and a writer. Can I get some love, please, for Angelina? <laughs> I've also got Dr. Leanne Levers here, who has a background in politics and international studies, as well as specialising in justice policy. Some love for Dr. Leanne Levers, please. And finally, I'm joined by Kareem Jamal, who's a multi-award winning historian and playwright. Let's get a round of applause, please, for Kareem. I'll sit in that one there, so we jump in that one. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a tight squeeze. I just realised one of those last clips, I'm wearing the exact same jacket and shirt, so it's a little bit <laughs> awkward, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get past that. Um, thanks, guys, for joining me tonight on, on the show. Um, I'm going to start with you, um, Karim. Can you tell me a little bit about how much black British history informs a lot of the work that you do, in particular as a, as a playwright? Good evening, everyone. Oh, you are there, OK. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it's not just black British history that informs my work, it's, it's history. Our, our story is global, you see. And I think when we tend to talk about black history, we start with Africa, which is fine, but we're everywhere, you see. And that's the thing that people don't understand, that wherever their people are, are black people were there. And so we shouldn't really be surprised uh, that when we see stories over here of some black um, character popping up in Serbia or Russia, or we think, oh, this is an anomaly or some strange... Uh, occurrence, but actually, you know, we, we are everywhere. Mm. Our presence is global. So, uh, in terms of what your question was, that uh, we recently started a series of plays. What we do as a historian, I, I do lectures, but I also teach through drama because I think the visuals are, are, are a good way of teaching. So, we stage plays and make the characters come alive so people can go to a theater and, and see a character like uh, Otto Bokogawan or Septimius Severus, Roman emperor living in, in York. People don't know about those things, see, and then actually brings to life on the stage. Uh, you know, and show that uh, we just uh, done a production called uh, um, I forgot my own name, my own production. Um, um, uh, Black voices in Britain before the Windrush, because we see to start with the Windrush as a, as a as a starting point. But we've always been here. Indeed, um, Angelina, do you feel that there is a significant lack of understanding from Black people about? our contributions to this country, when we first came to this country, or do you think, are you quite content with how much, as a community, we know about our history in this country? That's, that's a very difficult question. That's a very hard question to start um, off with. Because, you know, it's very difficult to sort of ascertain who knows what, really. Um, but I would say um, that certainly, it's very, how can I answer this question? I think there's a lot of people who don't know enough. Mm -hmm. That is a given. A lot of people don't know enough about um, black British history. Okay, I take your point that certainly um, black British history is a global history, certainly because it's part of a global empire, but that's global treatment. And I think people forget that. And I also take the point that um, uh, Windrush is not the starting point. It definitely isn't the starting point. So. Um, uh, I think people, uh, because uh, those narratives tend to be uh, take centre stage, um, people seem to assume that that's when things began. But certainly that, of course, isn't the case because we know that there was a significant black community here during the Edwardian period. We can actually even trace it back to the Roman period. And in terms of there being a consistent black 
African presence in this country since the 16th century consistent? I don't mean coming and going, I mean sure. a consistent presence since the 16th century and lots and lots of work has been done on that. Um, uh, the problem is, is that the history is very much um, uh, fragmented, I should say. Um, we are not yet uh, certainly within sort of like in people national consciousness or within everybody's consciousness a sort of uh, a sort of a treatment of history uh, black british history as a valid uh, field of study that's still um, not it is a valid field of study people are working on it studying researching it but it's not um, disseminating it's not being disseminated enough Indeed. Um, we'll be having a very uh, oh, chance for Q and A at the end of this. So any questions you guys have got, you want to ask the panel at the end. Um, please just kind of keep them in your heads, and we will get to you at the end of the discussion. Um, Dr. Levers, you're, you wasn't born in this country. No, I was not. You was not. So where was you born? I was born in Jamaica. There we go. Um, as someone that wasn't born here, how important do you feel it is for you and other people who do move to the UK to understand the history of of, of black history in this country in particular? Well, for me, it kind of falls in between the two answers that were just given. So I've had the pleasure, and I guess sometimes the misfortune, of uh, spending a significant amount of time across the diaspora. So I was born and raised in Jamaica. I did four years of undergraduate in the States, and then I moved here afterwards. Mm -hmm. And I think the importance of understanding black British history specifically is rooted in this idea that I think there is this overarching or there's this need for people to consolidate struggle and to assume, or it's easier for white people, to assume that all struggles are the same. Black Asian, uh, Caribbean, Af African American, British are all the same. And I think understanding the nuances and the very unique contributions that black British history has given towards developing an identity and to developing a very unique black British culture is extremely important. Because in understanding the history, you understand how to move forward, you understand what the issues are, you understand the nuances of the type of prejudice that you face within, Brit Brit within Britain versus the kind of discrimination that takes place within the states. And looking at the history develops a clear timeline as to how these things developed and then in moving forward, how to address them. So I think that's why it's most important for me. Are Saturday schools to the thing? Do we, are Saturday schools, do they still happen? Do, do, yeah, they, they do, yeah? How, how important are Saturday schools for our community in particular? Um, because on the curriculum in, in regular schools, you're not going to learn about Black British history. How, how, how significant are Saturday schools still today? Um, well, I think that uh, Saturday schools are still very much sig uh, significant. I work with a Saturday school in, in Croydon in South London. They've been going on for the past 30 years. But we do know that su supplementary schools started in the 1960s as a consequence of discrimination that children were facing at schools. Um, and also the fact that they, when they entered schools, um, uh, say if they came from the Caribbean, they were immediately being classed as educationally subnormal um, uh, by virtue of this is what people, this is what the educational system, how they regarded people of African heritage. They were not, simply not intelligent enough to, to, to do well in school. So as a consequence of that, parents, it was their parents that got together and established these supplementary schools. And they are very important, um, not only because they give them um, additional sort of uh, support, educational support, but also they give them um, their cultural heritage, their history and their heritage. What they would not learn in schools because schools, the, the mainstream system is not interested in teaching that they're in they're interested in maintaining the national identity which is the great and the good britain being great and britain being white when you think of british history you always equate it with being white history it's always racialized in that way so supplementary schools are ex extremely important as they were then in the 1960s and certainly now uh, in 2019 as uh, to instill uh, within our, our, our young people a sense of community a sense of responsibility and a sense of self-worth and self-empowerment and are you guys ever surprised about things that the average black person, I know that's a bit of a weird phrase in itself, but black people you kind of come across don't know about black British history. Is there anything that you kind of hear, oh, you didn't know that, or you didn't know that? Is there anything that ever surprises you or shocks you that we don't know about the history in this country? I think, uh, sorry, I don't want to speak. No, no, I think it's um, uh, it's maybe not the right question to be sh to to be uh, surprised by people who don't know anything, who may not know much or may not know enough. 
a lot of the times, um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm, not, I'm a lot older than you guys. My parents didn't teach me anything about Black, about Caribbean history, and I really wish they had about their experiences. My parents are fr uh, from Jamaica. I wish they told us a lot, uh, but they didn't. They didn't tell us anything because they thought, we're in Britain now, you're British, you should learn about British history. It never occurred to them, uh, and this is no um, uh, sort of indictment on my parents, it never occurred to them to, 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 to teach us about uh, our history and heritage. They thought that we are British, so we should learn about British history and British heritage. So it's never really uh, surprising um, but it, but having said that, it's important that they should know about their history. It's absolutely vital. Well, I'm just going just to add to that. I think it's also that there's a lot of information that seeks to misinform people about their own history. So for me, growing up, even though obviously Britain had a huge impact on Jamaica via colonialism and slavery, my awareness before coming here about Black British history was kind of limited to A. Windrush and stories about Mary Seacole. No. Stories about Mary Seacole, growing up as a kid, because we were never able to see pictures, a lot of us didn't know that Mary Seacole was black. You know, so there, and I think recently there was a whole uh, kind of story about black uh, or history books being given out in schools and directly misinforming young people about the history or the makeup of black families and completely distorting and demoralizing how people feel about their identity. And so I think there is a lot of work that's being done to dismantle British un black British unity and to kind of distort black British identity and I think that's a huge issue and so you're right I think it's not so much surprising that people are not aware because there is so much information that's available that's just erroneous. Uh, Kareem D. Yeah. So go on. Sorry, I, <laughs> no, go on, go on, go on. I was just going to say that the misinformation is in lots of ways deliberate. I mean if you keep, oh, yes. if you deliberately um, uh, distort a person's history keeps you in a certain place where you need to be. It's in certainly, it's in uh, the dominant culture's interest. It's in their interest for you not to know your history. Your history will empower you. And if you're empowered, you're going to start making certain demands that they're not willing to meet. So being ignorant in that sense is definitely a, 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 a deliberate act. You made the point, Grim, at the start there that um, because black black people have traditionally been all over the world, we're not, we're not just been in one or two places on the planet. How difficult then is it to kind of learn black British history in silo? Because if, if, we've, if we've been all over the world since, since day dot, is, is it even possible to kind of, okay, I want to learn about black British history. Is that, is that even possible if that's attached to other parts of, 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 of history? There's a lot being said, actually, which I, you know, I want to address. Going going back to before I answer that question about sure. the doing for self and Saturday schools and things like that. Um, and when we had this, we've been so engulfed with this whole Brexit thing, and a lot of the arguments were around about who's a foreigner and that kind of thing. It's really interesting because the English who pride themselves on being Anglo-Saxons are actually foreigners. Mm -hmm. it just depends on how far you want to go back for the narrative. Yeah, so <laughs> they're invaders. They only came here in the fifth century. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, depends on where you want to start the story as to who is an immigrant or not, you see. So um, on Saturday school, we teach what we call Africology. We, we turn it into knowledge. We don't talk about black history, we talk about Africology, which is a phenomenon of Africans uh, all over the world. So, uh, and you learn these kind of things that you would never have a hope of learning in school. Um, uh, and some of the things that you, you just said were really, really, really important about and Mary Seacole and not even knowing that she was you know, a black woman and things like that. But these things are not accidental, as you said. They're systematic things that are put in place to, to capture your mind. You see, uh, and to keep it in a place where you don't learn about yourself because then you're empowered and that kind of thing, you know. So this is systematic. We forget where we are. We're in Britain. Britain is the mother of all of these institutions and these systems that are set up. She is the master of them. Uh, and sometimes we forget where we really are and why we can't get ahead because these things are put in place to prevent you from stepping forward. And just, uh, just on the question of regarding learning about black history mm. and black British history, is it, how difficult is it understanding where we started, where we've gone? Is, is it possible to learn about black British history on, on its own? It is possible. It just depends on the will. Um, David Walker, an 18th century abolitionist, talked about the spirit of inquiry. So that comes from here. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you have to have the desire to want to know. To find information is easy. You've got Google. I mean, of course, you have to be empirical and you have to cross-reference. You can't just trust the first thing you see. So you have to cross-reference stuff and, you know, and be that way and that practical. But there's nothing preventing you, providing you have the desire to want to learn. And that's the thing. And the thing, what I work on initially or is the psychology, which is to take away the desire 
so you're apathetic. And you you know rather go on Xbox or you rather go... And we're the party people, aren't we? We, we like to have a good time. <laughs> and we have a good time. We don't have time for learning. And that's something that is encouraged, so we don't, we don't seek out those priceless pieces of information that would empower us. Ladies, are you noticing more and more people wanting to know about Black British history? And, you know, uh, is, is, is that on us? With Google, with the internet now, we don't really have an excuse. Do you know what I mean? There's not really an excuse anymore to seek out and find about your heritage and, and where this journey began. Are you noticing more and more people, black people are actually deciding, you know what, I, I want to know about my history and I'm gonna actively go out and find the truth? All the time, there is a real hunger. There has always been a hunger uh, to have knowledge of self. Mm. Um, uh, every time I do a talk, presentation, it is, it's full. People are interested. I think a couple of weeks ago, I did a talk with um, with a Carla at um, at the South Bank Centre, part of the Africa Utopia um, weekend, and every seat was taken. It was like 900 seats, which was, and every seat was taken. And uh, when we had the Q and A, people wanted to stand up and they wanted to ask questions. How do we do this? What do we do? How do we find out more? Where do we look? Always asking. It's the the, the hunger, the desire to learn is there. And just on that, uh, Dr. Levers, I'm noticing a lot more black people, I don't know if this is kind of just purely aesthetics, but changing their hair back to Afro and, you know, changing their name back to their, the, the name of their motherland. And they're, they're, I'm seeing in my circles a lot of black boys and girls um, uh, with, with a thirst and a hunger to kind of go back to their heritage. Is, is that just me or the, the clothes they wear as well and just being proud of who, the, who, who they are? No, I, th I definitely think that's true. And I think my generation in particular is definitely yearning to find their identity, not only in Britain, but in the States and in, in the Caribbean. That's becoming more and more of a, I don't want to call it a trend because I hope it, beco it, it, it is something that becomes sustainable. But I think it's something that's really... Um, something to be congratulated and because it is quite difficult in terms of identi uh, searching for your own history um, because of colonialism and slavery I think it's really difficult to find accurate detailed information on who you are you know so many people want to trace their ancestry and trace where they come from and what countries what African countries their ancestors are from and that becomes difficult because of the distinction in names and the you know the use of slave names by slave owners etc etc so I think the fact that people are going out of their way to really attend these events and the fact that people who are putting on these events are are addressing it in a very cultural way I, th I think you touched on this is that you know learning can take place in so many different ways and I think it's really empowering that we're using very traditional African ways of learning about our about our culture through dance through arts through film through uh, you know drama I think those are really important to not just to have the will to learn but also to utilize our in indigenous pathways of learning Would you agree with that yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think going back to the um, the yearning to, to learn and the, the changing of um, the way we see ourselves and how we dress ourselves and the hair and all that kind of thing. And our, our, our problem, our crisis of crisis of identity, you see, that's a lot of things that are happening to us as people is because we don't know who we are, you see. So you cannot behave or act in the manner in which you are supposed to be if you don't know what that identity is. So then you take on the identity of the people whom you live amongst. Can you expand on that? Yeah, okay. So if you don't have safeguards in place, if you come to a, let's use the word Babylon, <laughs> if, you look, if, you, if you move to a place that is foreign to you and you have a, a community, if you don't have safeguards in place to protect those cultural identities, then you become like the people you live amongst. You become the same. Because I remember when I go to school, you could, uh, when I was going to school, you know, it's good to see a lot of young people in here. You, you could think you could say that you heard and you could say straight away a black person, would, that's not a black person that did that. Like a news item, for instance, you know. You can't say that now, you know, because those behaviors are now become commonplace amongst us as well. Yeah. And that's because the cultural uh, parameters that we had and barriers to protect us are no longer in place. Um, is anybody, the three of you, is a question to you guys, are you noticing that socially and in the media, so many things now are not being accepted and you have certain words you can't use and certain phrases you can't use anymore and the whole, there's been a, a few incidents regarding black facing and 
images from the past that we all know have been acceptable, unacceptable and, and racist. But you're noticing that a backlash from black people in particular that are just not prepared to have it anymore, not write it off as banter or, you know, he, he didn't really mean it from a different generation. Are you guys also noticing a, a pushback on not having it in this country anymore? Um. I would say that it's certainly encouraging that that's happening, mm. um, uh, that people are rejecting these uh, these these behaviours. What's the problem is is the is the pushback from those who want to continue to do it. That that's I mean, as you said, African people, African British people, people of African heritage have always been pushing back. It's the problem is having to constantly having to justify why it's offensive, and 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 uh, what and white people or people who are doing that are saying why can't I do it? Mm -hmm. So I think we um, have to sort of look at explore that in a bit more interesting. It's about how they're culturally conditioned to think that the world belongs to them. Well, that's what they think. So why can't I do? I can do what I want, but we can't do what we want. And I think we need to sort of maybe explore that. Mm -hmm. Osliva, do you agree? Did, are you noticing the fact that, yeah, maybe we've always not been happy with certain references and terms being placed upon us, but there's still a lack of understanding amongst non-black people as to why? It's interesting. I, I do think that there is a pushback and that's becoming increasingly seen. But I also do think that, similar to what you were saying, there is this pushback from the powers that be to prevent us from doing so, whether that's in the workplace. You know, I... I uh, coordinate a group called Dope Black Women. And constantly within our group, we're having conversations about women being in the workplace and wanting to have a discussion about race and somebody saying something offensive and not being able to have the voice to do so. Just to even explain, much less to hold the person accountable. And I think the structures and the institutionalized prejudice that we have is a huge block in order to a have our voices heard and have it to be have the message to really be uh, to resonate and to be validated not that it, not that we should have to have it be validated but in order to create some sort of change that's kind of what you need mm -hmm. so i uh, i think it's i think it's great but i do think we have a long way to go and i think there's something to be said for unifying our voices i think there's still way too much dissension between the thoughts that Pete, we have as a community and the perspective that we have as a community because i'm constantly having arguments with people about the idea of how far we should go to fit in or how far we need to assimilate whether that's accents or or the way we dress or the fact that me wearing this Ghanaian print to work was a problem today, you know? So Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so I, I wore this today, and um, the, I have very few black people at work at, the, at my um, local authority, which shall not be named. But, um, but yeah, my boss took me to the side and said, oh, you're very colorful today, even though I'm wearing all black. <laughs> and, um, and he was like, oh, you know, maybe you should reconsider what you're wearing. And so it turned into a very long discussion about why I should be able to wear this and why I shouldn't be able to wear this and so on. And, and the only time we are allowed to, not allowed to, but the only time it is encouraged is um, during Black History Month, which it is today, but not on the day that is allocated within our institution for Black History Month. So I still think that those are huge issues. And there are people within my, within my workplace, within the community that I try to you know, fit myself into that are quite happy to just slip right in because it means that they'll be able to keep their job. It means that they'll be able to live their life comfortably. It means that they won't have to deal with the pressures of holding other people to account. And I, and I do recognize that that's not everybody's role. Not everybody is, is equipped to have that voice and that's fine but to oppose it or to push back on people who are trying to to have that voice i think is problematic and i, f I find it still far too present within the community i think what you just said you're talking about two distinct things happening here you've got like uh in the media for example you've got all these clamoring of voices that saying this is unacceptable we should all sort of uh we shouldn't take this type of behavior but the other reality is you going into your workplace and then having to deal with these which is a microaggression yeah, that's a microaggression that people are still facing day to day so we have to think about in it to the extent to which this type of uh discourse that is uh, getting a lot of um a lot of tra a lot of traction up here uh, to what extent is it coming down is it trickling down to the reality of people's experiences on a day-to-day -day basis. 
we, we did a live show um, f- f- about four or five months ago with um, Marvin Harrison, who runs Dope Black Dads. And he made an interesting point in the discussion we had about, as a community, we need to, d- to decide, basically, are we trying to make roots in this country and change it to, su- to support and work for us? Or are we just here as a stopgap and we're looking to go back to our Afri- African country or Caribbean country of heritage? As someone that wasn't born here, is this a country that you feel you are here for the long term or do you have plans to, to go back to your motherland? I am definitely going back to my motherland. I think in me, I mean, my entire academic career, whether it's been in the States or been here, has been focused on um, empowering the diaspora community. Whether that's here, whether that's in Jamaica, Jamaica is my home, it's where I was raised, it's where my heart is. So I definitely have plans about going back to Jamaica um, for sure. But I think in terms of being here and for people who choose to settle here, it's a very interesting dilemma, right? Because you are literally living in a system as, uh, I don't know if you've read any of Kende Andrews' work, um, but he basically talks about the fact that this system was never intended for black people to succeed. And so how do you operate on a day-to-day basis? Do you uh, kind of submit, uh, submit to the idea of assimilation and fitting in? Or do you just say, can I correct? Oh, do you just say, you know, fuck it and and let's bomb up the whole system and start afresh, which would be my approach um, if I had a choice. But yeah, so sometimes you have to really it's a it's a you're between a rock and a hard place because you want to live in a world of equality. But you also have to recognize that the system was never intended to achieve equality. And so where do you go from here? What's your stance on that, Kareem? Are you someone that is looking to you know, fight and change the country that you live in now to be better for you, your kids, your kids' kids, generations to come? Or are you kind of on the mindset that, you know what, this country's not for us and we need to have serious thoughts about going back to a country that maybe isn't perfect, but at least is, is set up for you to, to succeed and be happy? Okay, so I think um, wherever we have satellite communities in the world, it's important that the base community, the base, the mother base, which is Africa, is strong. You see, uh, if you look at the spate of um, murders in America, where you know you got black men on their knees with their hands up, being shot. Okay, if that was a let's say Chinese, and there was a whole spate of Chinese killings of young black Chinese males, then do you think China would have something to say about that? Of course, it would stop very quickly. So. Because we have no strong power base, Africa is fragmented, and because it's been made to, to, to maintain that way. I mean, I mean, some West African countries are still playing, you know, money to France. You know, the banks of these federation of these national uh, and sovereign nations are in France, and the money passed from France first before they get it. So all these things, you know, are, are designed to make sure you don't have a strong power base. So then, wherever Africans are in the world, we can be treated anyway. So we could have strong satellite communities, but we have to have a strong mothership first. Um, Kareem mentioned the B word earlier on. Uh, it's coming. We're in the month where you know, the B word. Yeah. Bre- no, Brexit. Oh, Brexit. Yeah. <laughs> 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 All right. So I won't ask you that question then. I'll, I'll ask you, Kareem. Yeah. With Brexit looking like it's going to happen one way or another, how significant is that for the black community in this country? And what blowback do you predict for, for our community? Well, uh, I'm not a soothsayer, but I will say this. I think Brexit has been a distraction. A lot of things have been passing under the bridge while Brexit's been happening. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they, if, you, if you understand, um, oh gosh, if you look at history as a historian, you, can, you, have, um, you have parallels and you have, uh, you have uh, things that have happened in the past, which you can then draw upon to see what's happening. So you can see that this Brexit thing, where we're being engulfed with this conversation, and nothing seems to be happening, but every day is Brexit, to get you tired of the, you know, the name Brexit. But other things have been happening, while well, that's been happening, you know. Um, I won't go into some of the stuff, because it may be a bit sensitive, you know, in this, in this forum, but uh, other things have been passed, laws, new laws have been passed, you, you know, new dictates, new edicts have been, you know, have been put out there, and when Brexit is finally over and done with, then you see the whole, Lots of other things have changed around you. Say, well, when did it happen? Mm-hmm. Well, it happened when the discussion about Brexit was taking place, and no one noticed because we've been distracted by, by that conversation. Um, do you have any questions from from our audience here? First of all, today, and don't be shy. I've got, got a gentleman in the front. I've got one more, and then can we get a microphone to our gentleman in the front? Um, just my final question was: Who are the black figures in history that you feel that black people in this country should 
should should know about and should go out tomorrow and, and seek more knowledge about? Well, there's so many. Um, you should, if you should know about Claudia Jones, that's for sure. You should know about uh, George Padmore, although he was more international. Uh, well, both were international. Um, John LaRose, you should know about the work of John LaRose. Um, uh, I think that's a good... Uh, and obviously, Equiano, Equiano's work, Mary Prince's work, um, her narrative on her experience of being enslaved in Bermuda. Um, and Cuguanos, you should start with those classics. And um, uh, Ignatius Sancho's work, his diaries he wrote in the 1760s and 1780s, 1750s to 1780s. I think that's where we should start. And where are, where are the, 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 the reliable and trustworthy websites that people can go to to find out more about black British history? Um, well, the Black History Month magazine um, website is a good one. Um, 100 Great Black Britons has a good... Um, as a good uh, as a bibliography, good uh, resource list, I'll start there. Um, but yeah, just as get get on those books to to, to begin oh, with. No yeah, to find out more. Absolutely. Cool. Can we get a mic to the gentleman at the front, please? Um, hey, I was going to ask uh, this brother here. Sorry, I forgot your name. Kareem. 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 Um, about the uh, uh, what you said about Brexit and the sort of things that have gone underneath, but I don't know if that's straying away from this topic. No, go for it, it's your question. Okay. So can you elaborate a bit more about some of the laws that may have been passed that people don't know about clandestinely? I really don't want to say too much about this particular thing, but I, I would say this, um, that our voices have been silent, so almost that you can't say, you can't go to work, you talk about dressing in certain attire. You can't go to work and you can't s s say certain things for fear of losing your job. Um, other groups can quite easily have that conversation openly, but you can't say the way you feel about certain things. For instance, um, I forgot the name of the actress, the young actress that lost the role in The Color Purple. Uh, reading about it on Tuesday. Because she had put something on Facebook five years ago, and, and one of the actors dragged it up, you know, another brother, and the day before they were begun to open. And it was something that she was, she, she's, a, she's, a, she's a Christian. So she has certain beliefs and she has the right to that. And she said five years ago something about she didn't believe that people were born gay. That's her opinion, fair enough. And she had made an opinion about it on Facebook and that was five years prior. This gentleman found it, dragged it up and put it out there on Twitter and she lost the role because of it. Um, it was the day before the opening and so on. So I thought, because she couldn't say how she felt about that. And I think she has the right to say what she feels. You know, everyone has the right to say what they feel. She wasn't, she wasn't hating on anybody. She was just saying, this is what I believe. That's all she said. So um, there's certain conversation we can't have because the power paradigm uh, is, is shifted uh, you know, greatly. And I think Brexit is a distraction where lots of these things have passed under the, you know, under the bridge. Any more questions, guys? Don't be shy. There we go, lady in the middle. Hello. Um, so my question is um, about more about the history and actually f when when black people do find out about the history of Britain, like I recently read the book Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race, and there was a whole chapter on like the slave um, ports in Liverpool, and I learned a lot. I didn't use Google. That was how I find found out things. Um, so then after reading that book, how do you kind of manage your view of white people? How do you like not despise them after finding out the history? <laughs> Yeah, basically, how do you challenge, um, yeah. Um, I do my best to ignore, personally. So my approach has always been, I care about people who care about me and my community. And if you don't fall into that category, then I'm not concerned. And unless I'm affronted with it, as I often am at work, um, the way that I reconcile it is just finding my safe space, finding my community and being able to be able to vent to them and having them to be able to understand without me having to explain it. And I can't uh, express how comforting that is. And also every now and again, taking a holiday. So, you know, going, uh, growing up, uh, and this is one of the reasons that I love or I'm so proud to be a Jamaican is because I can't, again, express to you how empowering it is to go home and to be able to see a black president or a black prime minister. And the fact that most, if not all of our prime ministers since independence have been black. We've had a black female prime minister, people in power, they're all 
you know, of black are are either black or at least of black descent because we have a huge uh, mixed race population in Jamaica as well. So I think reaffirming your space within the communities that you have here, but also exploring the empowerment that you can find outside of your outside of Britain as well, and going back to the spaces that uh, you're from. You know that 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 heritage and that those stories lie within. Um, I can't. I I'm not going to answer your question directly, but I will make a comment on what you just said in terms of what you just discovered and learned about Britain's role in the transatlantic enslavement of Africans. So that you just found out is very interesting because historically that history has totally been removed, okay? That's removed from the historical narrative. What's been supplanted is the abolitionist movement. So uh, Britain has created a kind of usable past. We're not gonna talk about what we did, but we're gonna talk about what we ended. Aren't we great people? Okay, so that's also deliberate. Why would you want to talk about the, the, the crimes against humanity that you committed? Okay, you'd rather talk about how you ended those crimes against humanity. So this is why you or, or lots of us did not learn about enslavement in schools. Okay, this is why so many uh, stately homes, families who continue to benefit financially from from ha having from slave ownership, do not want anybody to know about their involvement. This is why, for example, Lloyd's of London will not allow very few people to look at their records and similarly archives around the country. So um, it's up to you, your own personal uh, decision on how you want to, how you want to view people, of, or, or view Europeans, view white people, but you need to know that this was again a, another deliberate act because um, they know it's like, for example, during uh, the First World War, for example, right? So lots of Africans, over nearly a million Africans served in the World War, First World War, okay? 17,000 men from the Caribbean served in the British West Indies Regiment, okay? Now, uh, Britain did not want those people to serve, did not want those men in the British West Indies Regiment to serve, even though they wanted to enlist, they wanted to fight for king and country. They were consistently rebuffed over and over again up until 1915 when, they, when, uh, the, when King George V intervened and said it would be impolitic to continue to refuse the service of these men. Why did they not want these men to, to serve? Well, because if you put guns in the hands of black men, maybe they'll turn it on the white men. That was the reason why they did it. So there is certainly a level of guilt amongst people or amongst European people that they do not wish uh, for you to know about your history. Now your history, I want to make that point, is the history of enslavement is one part of the grand narrative, the grand narrative of African history. But it's, uh, from my point of view, that's when our problem started. Our problem started in 1441 when the Portuguese started to enslave people in the city of Lagos in, in, and brought them, brought them from uh, the Cape Principe and Cape Verde Islands and brought them to Lagos in, in Portugal. So that's when our problems started and this is where, why we find ourselves in this, pro in this current situation today. So from there, then you have to make your own decisions about what you, where you plan to go forward from here. George, can I just expand on something? Yes, please, please. Um, I think three points, if I can remember more, actually. Um, talking about, as your sister said, just now about how do you feel about that? We, we have to remember that the, the, the race is an invention. You need yes. to know that, first of all. It's Johannes Blumenthal, yeah, <laughs> who, it's not even science. If you go back to Johannes Blumenthal, when he talks about race, mongoloids, australoids, negroids, all of these oids, yeah, it's the way he feels. He found a pristine skull in, in the area we now know as Georgia in the Caucasus. And he says the most beautiful skull he's ever seen was white. I, I've never seen any other color skull, by the way. I don't know. Me neither. <laughs> yeah. And it was beautiful. And he said, but on, uh, this is the Caucasian skull. It must be, this, on this pretext is what he bases the white supremacist argument on. So it becomes science because he puts it in a book. And then the Royal Society endorses it. And so then we all believe it because we read it and it's Dr. So-and-so said it. It's not science, it's, no, it's nonsense. Everything comes from you, by the way. Um, you are able to create every single type of phenotype, physical, biology that there is exists in the world. You go to South Africa and Namibia, you see, you see the, the Khoi people, the Khoi San people. They look like Mongols, not Mongols, Mongoloids. 
yeah, from uh, what you see in the steppes of Central Asia with slanted eyes and stuff like that. This is all, they have so many different types of gene types in there. So these are not things which are spontaneous life popping up all over the world with different characteristics. They all come from you, number one. So race is an invention, number one. Going back to Britain and how they glorify their role in the abolition of slavery, 1807, the slave trade mm -hmm. is abolished in 1807, but slavery is not abolished until 1833. So that's, I asked myself, well, what's going on there, first of all? Okay, and then Britain uh, uh, capture a number of ships, Dutch ships, Spanish ships, Portuguese ships, you know, to show the world that they are, you know, this the new beacon of light in the world. But, how many of you know about the Berlin Conference? 1884, 50 years later. Mm -hmm. We have the division of Africa around a table mm -hmm. where they all decide at the, at the behest of uh, von Bismarck, Bismarck to come to Germany, to Berlin, and sit around a table, let's discuss this in a civilized fashion instead of fighting each other. One thing you have to understand, that these people are enemies, France and Britain have been enemies for, th for over a thousand years, but they will have a discourse about something that's mutually beneficial and symbiotic, yeah? If we don't, have to ki we don't kill each other, right? So, okay, we can go back to fighting each other after, <laughs> but let's, <laughs> let's uh, divide this piece of cake. And Britain got what they call from Cape to yeah. Cairo. So you can imagine Egypt to South Africa, mm -hmm. how much land that, because I mean, you know, African continent can fit most of the world in there. Let's start there. And Britain got all of that and all the resources contained therein. So, you know, this, these are things that we, we need to know. So the more you, 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 you research the stuff, you understand the politic, the geopolitics. That's what we teach in Africology. We don't just teach okay. about glorifying about pyramids and pharaohs. That's great. We celebrate that. But how does that affect my position today in the, today's world? And what can I do about it? Okay. You guys are the YouTube generation, right? Go on YouTube and look up Basil Davidson's Africa, seven series, seven programs made in Channel 4 about 1984. If you want to understand about everything that Kareem's just been talking about, the Berlin Conference, colonialism, he does it in a, a marvellous way. And Basil Davidson is an excellent uh, historian. Awesome. So there you go. Africa, Basil Davidson, YouTube. All, 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 all the episodes are on there. I saw about four phones coming out with people writing that down. <laughs> Even my director over there has got his phone out. Um, I have a question, final question for you guys, because it's a relatively young, young crowd here. I mentioned earlier on the fact that a lot of my friends are getting very close to their identities as people of African descent, be it going back to their original names and having their hair and dressing a certain way. Do you guys, who in the audience is proud to say they are black and British. Who identifies as black and British? Just put your hand up if you would happily say, I'm black and British. Okay, so the lady in the glasses, um, can we get, yeah, yeah, you. Can we get, can we get a mic standing in the glasses just to kind of, I just want to explore. Um, and it, it, look, being black and British is not a dirty, it's not a dirty thing, it's not a negative. I'm just interested to know what it is exactly. Oh, I mean, you can go first, but I've been one behind you. No, no, you, you, can go, you can go first, you can go first. Because she don't want to do it, but you, she's going to do it, but you can go first. Um, the reason I would identify as black and British is because I I was born here first of all. My parents are Jamaican, but because I don't know much about the Jamaican history and I don't know much about the black British history either, but I think because I've just been, you know, born and raised and when I go back when I used to go back home to Jamaica they would call me a foreigner as well. So it's sort of like this is the closest thing to my identity. Like going back home, they don't see me as Jamaican. So it's like. So what is it about being black and British that you particularly identify with? Is it the food here? Is it the, the weather? Is it the way they talk? Is it the fashion? Is there other things that you tangibly identify with as black and British? Um, I would say that black British people have a certain culture, like the music, the food, the way we sort of do things. And it's very different from being black African or being being black Caribbean and being from those places, like born and raised like how you were. We are very different. We both, I'd say I'm Jamaican as well, if people were to ask me, but I don't know. I think it's very different, very different culture. Maybe you'd agree. It's quite a well. personal question and tell me to go away if, if it's too personal. On forms, what do you put? Black. Black British, if it's asking, but sometimes it says Caribbean or African, I so I'd put Black Caribbean. I see. Can I just say that that form annoys me like no other? The overlapping of race and ethnicity is so problematic for me. So for me, I can't tick a box. There is no box that I fit into because I am Caribbean, um, but I and but I'm also I'm half Asian, I'm half Black, so there is literally no box that fix, fits me. However. 
if I'm in any other country where overlapping of race and ethnicity doesn't exist, I simply just tick mixed. And why is that? I, I don't understand why the necessity, I do understand the necessity, but I, I find it hugely problematic that I was talking to another girlfriend of mine who is black British and her parents were born here, her grandparents were born here, so she has three generations of being British. And she was at the doctors and they asked her what her ethnicity or what her race was and she said black British. And they said, where are you from? Britain. Where are your parents from? Britain. Where are your grandparents from? Britain. And they literally forced her to take Afro-Caribbean. Mm. And so even the idea of being proud to be a black British person still doesn't, can't say yeah, it. you can't do it, you know? Or you're not allowed to. Can I just say something quickly? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So, uh, I've not forgotten right, by the way. I'm coming to you next, don't worry. Same question. <laughs> I think we get confused. Nationality is not identity. Because you can be Canadian in one year, and then you go and live somewhere else, and in five years you qualify as something else. So is a goat born in a hutch a rabbit? No, it's still a goat, right? So it's not, <laughs> nationality is not your identity. It's just where you're placed at a given time. And this is where you belong to. So it's a political ideology, really. So it doesn't speak to your identity. There's something else. And the lady in the glasses behind. For me, I think I would say I'm black British just because of technically what she said. As like I was raised here, I was born here. Um, I am Nigerian, but I didn't learn my dated tongue unfortunately um, and also I just feel like growing up with other Afro-Caribbean people we kind of did create our own little subculture and in that we've learned how to speak in a, dial in a way that you know we're used to like the things that we um, do has its own identity so I think it's quite important to recognize that we do have a culture here we do have an identity people do want to identify as black british that should still be celebrated because there is a lot of work that has been done and we're still going to continue to do it because we're living here and i don't see a lot of us well i can't say that but i feel like a lot of us will stay here and we want to build something here and leave a legacy here so i think identify as black british isn't that much of a bad thing so you say that's how you don't, are you proud though so if someone's uh, do you say it because it's, yeah it's kind yeah. of what i am or are you gonna say yeah i'm, I'm black and i'm black and british yeah number one i'm I always say I'm Nigerian. I'm proud Nigerian, ah, and then I'm proud okay, British. Caveat, so yeah, it's yeah. like, <laughs> so it's. But you it are depends. both things, and yeah. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Can be both. I'm just winding. Yeah. Yeah. Only winding you up. Yeah. Um, can I hear the uh, Basil at the front here, the gentleman? I want to. I want to hear from a guy, a, a, a young man. Um, do you are you are you black and British? And if so, is that something that you're very open and kind of forward and proud to kind of proclaim? I wouldn't say I am. Um, just because from young, um, my parents always instilled in us that really and truly we were not like everyone else in this country and ultimately from from young we always went back to Nigeria so we always had the the cultural element at home there was always the teachings and we understood um, what it was to be Nigerian and the history but it's it's, it's a funny one because I because obviously when questions are asked always first thing I always say is I'm Nigerian um, just to let people know but Growing up in school was very multicultural, um, from primary school to secondary school, and everyone had their own um, history, everyone had their own culture, which they could share with others. And I think that made you proud of where you came from because you could see it from other people around you, whether they came from the Philippines, whether they came from different parts of Africa, whether they came from different parts of the Caribbean. Everyone was proud um, to be, everyone was proud to know where they come from. And I think um, from the friends and the people I knew, um, everyone understood their culture and where the parents came from and I think there was an element of teaching that came down from their parents where people understood um, their country's mm -hmm. origins whereas if you compare it to um, America uh, many of them don't really know where they're from and they find it confusing where we identify first from the countries our parents were born from and we have an element of understanding and education as to what our countries are from, what our countries are like, whether it's from Africa or the, or the Caribbean. Um, I just have one final question and I've got to wrap. Um, does anybody that wasn't born in this country or have parents that are not born from this country find it difficult to maintain their Nigerianness or their Jamaicanness? Is it a constant fight to try and preserve you know, the, the heritage of where you come from? I'll start with you, Basil. Being in this country, do you find it difficult to to, to not eat fish and chips and to not talk English and to not listen to, I don't know, Coldplay or whatever, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I, I think I'll say when I... It's quite easy for you. Yeah, no, no, I'll say, <laughs> I'll say no. When I was younger, it definitely 
was quite difficult just because I don't think we embraced it as much um, just because sometimes it can be seen as embarrassing but I'll say over the last let's say decade or so it seems there's a resurgence of people who are proud to display um, various aspects of their culture and celebrate it more and I think right now in, in the day and age we live in there's more openness to show that to show how proud you are and to create various platforms where people can openly you know conversate with each other and create these communities where they can celebrate that um guys we've got a fantastic uh poet coming up to finish off the evening but um before we wrap up can i get a round of applause please to my three panelists please thank you very much um we had on the one of our early live shows um, a gentleman called Trees Without tree, tweet, Trees with Roots. Put your teeth in, Jordan. Um, and he smashed it so much. I invite him to come back. So can I invite um, Trees with Roots to come to the stage, please? And we'll vacate the stage. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. How are we doing? Good. We're good. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, so this is a poem called Roots, um, and it's a tribute to Malcolm X. There is power in a people who know their names, who can trace their lineage back all the way to the place of their original race, who know themselves and can proudly say, I know from where I came. Now I can finally say my, I'm at peace with the way my heritage was displaced. We were given new names so that forever we be changed. Broken, disunited and known as a Carter or a Dale. This is why they disconnected us from our roots. For helping me to see that Malcolm to you I salute. No longer a victim of abuse. I have removed the identity that was left stamped on my breast. I have decided to undress and replace it with an X so that I can refine that treasure chest containing all those gems of knowledge and history which was literally ripped from me to arrest my spirit and strip from me. My humanity. I choose to break free from this insanity. In school, they had me itching like a fiend. My self-esteem was crushed by the same regime that calls my people backwards and the West supreme. Whilst at the same time, missing out key parts of my people's history. Like how even before there was a West, Africa had kings and queens that influenced all these civilizations from the Greeks to the Romans, Hebrews and Germans, or even how Britain's revolution was built from slavery. But I guess that's what happens when we allow our kids them to feed from the same hands that oppresses we. And I always wondered how cotton got into these industries. Until the lion tells its tale, the story will always glorify the hunter. I understand my people went through lightning and thunder. How we're still here shows our strength. I gasp and wonder. We are survivors of one of the most violent plunders. But rising like a Viking, I'm fighting for my right and light in a fire because God knows we need uniting. If only we knew our history, we would walk tall, look in our sisters and brothers, proud of us all. The obelisk that you probably know as the Washington Monument was originally taken from Africa and known as the Tekken. It symbolized the resurrection of life 2,000 years before the coming of Christ. When I learned this, wow, I surprised my mind, died inside, revived my life, re-arrived and jived. When I realized my truth, I was reborn. Now tears form streams as they fall from my eyes as I see my people blinded to our truth. One look at our youth and it becomes clear we are trees that have lost our roots. So tonight, I encourage you to recover the loot which was taken from us and stuffed in the boots of these Theban pirates because now these empires have reached the highest peak. They must now reap their entire seeds of pillaging their colonies like cancers. The biggest thieves and gangsters are not in the news. Oh, no, 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 no. They are reserved in the rooms and offices of museums, robbing hoods in reverse, conserving so many of our articles. You would have thought it was farcical how far these tools would go to keep us from re-reaching our cardinal. Black Madonnas, Banean bronzes to Sphinx noses. We are powerful. We just don't know it. Read. Know your history. Wake up and rise. Remove the sleep from your eyes. Sleeping is for the night. This is the hour to decide where our future will lie. We have to ask ourselves, what will we be? A generation of revolutionaries like Malcolm X or the generation that's stuck on our beds? And I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Where can people find more of your, more of your work? People find more of my work. Um, Trees with Roots. Uh, I, you can search me on Instagram, Trees with Roots. I'm still kind of fresh with the... Uh, online social media kind of stuff, but you can find me on Instagram, Trees With Roots. And I'll be doing a few bits of pieces, painting projects, some more uh, poetry um, in the future. 
So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you very much. Big up, man. Um, we're going to wrap it there, guys. But thank you very much for coming out tonight. If you're not following us across all of our socials, please, please do so. We're also on, uh, we have a website as well, www.blackademic.com. That's blackademic spelled without a C. Um, we will be launching season four just after Christmas. We have plenty more content. And what we want to we do is get a lot more ideas from you guys. So let us know on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email us what discussions you feel are important that should be had. Um, and if you've got guests you think would be great, let us know. Please get in touch with us and um, let's make this more of an interactive thing. We will be back here on the 15th for another discussion which we'll be having which will be on why US major stars hip hop stars are jumping on grime music so what is it about major US figures that are so 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 jump you know so interested in UK grime music and I think it's more than just money but anyway 15th of um, of this month tickets are available as we speak so if you want to come back in two weeks time for a panel for discussion on that subject or anything more than that hit us up let us know follow us on our socials thanks for coming out tonight get home safe guys thank you very much thank you What's happening people? I really hope you enjoyed that last show. I really, really did. We've got so much more content for you to check out. Go and check out some of our videos right there. Go and click on that video there. All of our content also is on blackademic.com for all of our podcasts and all of our videos. Enjoy it, check it out. See you there.